Indexing over the last couple of years has really sort of exploded, and it's exploded in tandem with a lot of product creation, uh, specifically with exchange-traded funds. But indexing really started as, as an editorial function, right? So Charles Dow, 1896, creates the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It had 12 stocks at the time. It's price-weighted, which is a, a very archaic mechanism nowadays. Um, but it, he did it just to sell newspapers, right? A few years later, it expands, it expands, and it comes to 30 stocks, um, which is its current iteration. Uh, 1957, the current iteration of the uh, S&P 500 came to be, uh, and it too was created to be a proxy for the U.S. equity market. When people say, what did the market do? That's the response. It started as an editorial function, and only in the last couple of years, as John said, because of some movements within the derivatives industry, did they become the basis for financial products. Uh, and it's really exploded. So today, there are nearly $7 trillion in, in, in assets, U.S. dollar in assets, benchmarked to just our indices, S&P Dow Jones indices. There are um, about $2.5 trillion directly based upon our indices, so products that are based upon our indices. Uh, and we calculate over a million indices. Now, that's a lot of indices, as anyone would argue, right? So as I said, it started as an editorial function to describe what was going on in the marketplace, and we had equities, and then it made sense to, well, let's expand beyond just domestic equities. Let's go to international equities. And when, when Dow Jones first started building international indices, we had a global index family. It had 12 countries. Like, that's, that's not really representative of a global activity, right? So you expand upon that, you introduce more countries, and then you start cleaving that universe up into, well, sectors. You know, I, 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 like, I want to know globally what's going on, What's going on in technology? What's going on in, in uh, energy and industrials and consumer discretionary? And then let's carve that up into size and style. And let's carve that up in a whole host of other different ways. And that works great for equities. Let's do it for fixed income now. Let's do it for commodities. Um, there's a whole host of different, um, different uh, investment themes and strategies. And here's just sort of a sample of what we do. So we do global equities, we do domestic equities, we do fixed income indices, we do commodity indices, we do all sorts of thematic or strategy-oriented indices. Um, things like Sharia-compliant indices. You take a, a, an overall universe, you cull out via exclusionary criteria, you take out stocks that violate Sharia, um, uh, Sharia law. That's very applicable to Middle East dollars, right? So that's a theme that applies very well. There's a lot of assets tracking that. Sustainability indice, um, ESG, environmental, social governance, doing well by doing good. That's a concept that's very strong. Things that just look at dividends, things that look at different investment themes and strategies have been big. Uh, and another area that's, that's, that's expanded, and again, is primarily for the editorial function, is one of economic indices. So you may hear during drive time radio the last Tuesday of every month, Case Shiller housing indices, track US real estate, um, economic indices, uh, such as uh, US healthcare claims, um, Experian credit default indices. All these are different ideas. Constant question we get asked is, yeah, but that's, isn't that enough? Like a million, come on, that's enough indices, right? Truth is there's always something happening to create a new opportunity in indexing. There's always some catalyst, whether it's regulatory in nature, whether it's uh, the opening of a new market, whether it's the, uh, the evolution of, um, of particular regions, it's the emergence of new themes, it's all sorts of academic research that gives birth to new investing ideas. There's always something that creates a new index idea. And that's how we get up to that number, and it's so significant. So, okay, great, so we have a lot of indices. It started as an editorial function. The explosion in indexing the last few years, the enormous amount of assets that are tracking it, the growth in exchange-traded funds, why? Why is that driving so much? Well, there's a huge amount of academic research uh, that supports investing according to indices. Uh, the, the very first public uh, mutual fund based upon the S&P 500, the very first index fund uh, was based upon the 500. It's John Bogle at a Vanguard that was 1976. Um, and John was, no question, just a huge proponent and a big evangelist on using passive-based products and really drove that. I mean, the, the, you know, that's, that's the, we stand on the shoulders of giants when we look at guys like John. Um, uh, in fact, the very first index fund was, was managed by Exxon. It was their internal fund. It was like 1970. They, they even started doing earlier than that. 
Um, but what supports that? Why do that? Well, we publish on a regular basis this thing called SPIVA, and that just stands for S&P Index versus Active. The SPIVA report, it's S&P Index versus Active. And what this is, it's really sort of the proof case for William Sharp's kind of seminal piece, The Arithmetic of Active Management, right? And, and active, by the way, active versus passive, just to be clear, active management means you've got an active investment manager. You've got an investment manager that's ex exercising some degree of discretion. He or she has a team of analysts looking at all sorts of models. They have a financial thesis that they follow in order to build that investment portfolio. But they're actively making decisions intra-period to say, I like this, I don't like this, let's, let's push the weight up on this particular stock, let's knock down on this, I'm worried about Ukraine, so we've got exposure there, let's minimize that. That's an active exposure. Passive is just following an index. Index publisher creates the index, the manager of an, an investment product follows that, that basket precisely. So Bill Sharp's piece says, listen, after expenses, active has to underperform passive. Has to. And, and the essence of it is, if investors as a whole own the marketplace, then investors as a whole, after expenses, can't possibly outperform the marketplace. That's the essence of it. This is it in reality. So we do this on a period, periodic basis. We do it in the, in the US, we do it in Australia, we do it in Canada, we just did it in Europe, we're doing it in India. What we do is we take using a database of mutual funds, publicly available mutual funds that anybody can invest in, compare their performance to the benchmark. And what this shows is that, especially over a longer period of time, the vast majority, large majority, of active managers underperform their benchmark after costs. Now, there are little segments here and there that tend to do well. International small cap, where there may be some especially um, a salient information that a local manager will really be able to tap into. But for the most part, active managers underperform their benchmark. And so over the years, this, this message has really gained a great deal of purchase and people start to realize, why am I paying an active manager? Why can't I just buy the benchmark and just buy an index fund and tend to outperform? That's been the basis for the growth. This is also an interesting little funky wonky thing that we've, we've been calculating for a little while that supports this message. This is dispersion. This is dispersion of the S&P 500. It's maybe different dispersion than, than what Ethan's comfortable or, or familiar with as a trading uh, function, but dispersion is simply a measurement of how widely dispersed the components are, uh, the, the returns of a particular component set are. So, for example, if every single stock returns 5%, Every single stock in the S&P 500 returns 5%, dispersion zero. There is no dispersion. They're not dispersed at all. But we know not every stock does the same thing. They go up, they go down, they stay static, they do it over different periods of time. This measures the degree to which they do that. And the way to think about dispersion is, dispersion is essentially the opportunity for a manager to find sources of outperformance, to find sources of alpha over and above the benchmark. Well, what we've recognized in, in measuring this is dispersions at nearly historic low levels based upon the way we've been calculating it. So after the financial crisis, when everything cratered, everything went down together, commodities, fixed income, you know, the only thing you wanted to be in was cash and ammunition because everything else was awful, right? That was your only investment. This, it, you know, everything went down together. As we started to come out of that the last year or so, as, as, as markets started to improve, people said, well, we're in a stock picker's market now. There's really an opportunity for people to be managers to exercise discretion and pick the opportunities. Truth is, the numbers don't seem to support that. Numbers seem to support that there really aren't that many opportunities for active managers to go out and find opportunities. Again, that sort of supports the idea that passive index-based funds are the way to go. And so here's what's happening, right? So this adoption has really uh, ticked up pretty significantly. Um, recent UK proposal, all local pension funds should put 50% of their assets into passive funds as opposed to active. That's a big move. Uh, Maryland, the state uh, public pension fund, um, or public policy center said, state pension funds should just go passive. Should just go passive, that's our recommendation. Um, big plans, big plans like CalPERS, um, California Public Employees Retirement System, huge public pension fund, have kind of started to indicate that their default equity allocation, if they're going to buy stocks, they're going to buy stocks, it's going to be a passive approach. That's what, they're going to go to an index tracking fund. And so on and so on and so forth, all the way down. A really interesting one is this, which is the chart. 
from 2000 currently. In red are hedge fund assets. I mean, hedge funds are like the crystallization of seeking alpha, right? Of, of people really trying to get out performance. ETF assets, which are the very crystallization of passive, are on track to breach them. I mean, that's a really interesting sort of you know, philosophical shift that alpha is really starting to lose, alpha seekers are really starting to lose out to beta replicators. That's an interesting, interesting point. So what's going on in our industry right now? So we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the very first ETF. It was based upon the S&P 500. It's called Spider. It's got 170 billion in it, 20 years hence. We've got a huge amount of ETFs now. There's about two trillion in ETFs in the States. Uh, there are about 1,600 ETF listings. There's hundreds more in, in um, registration with the SEC. The types of things you're seeing more now are kind of replications or systematic approaches to active, if you will. Coming out now are these things called, and you, you see them, definitionally people call them different things. Um, some people, the, the more common term is smart beta. I hate the idea of smart beta because it implies there's dumb beta. Put that aside. Smart beta, alternative beta, strategic beta, factor-based indices. What these do is they take a universe like the S&P 500 and they amplify or they attenuate different factors. Maybe momentum, maybe size, maybe value, maybe uh, volatility. Uh, and they try to, it, what this really starts to look like is it's, it's getting in a beta form, in an, a passive or index-based form, what you would have paid an active manager to do. But you would have paid them a lot more to do it. All right, how did I get here? Um, so to the degree that it's interesting. Um, indexing, we were, we were always sort of the weird little group at the end of the hall, especially at Dow Jones, nobody knew what we did. Um, it's a strange little universe, if you will, but it's kind of blown up the last few years. And so I, I truly very blessed in, to find myself within this industry. Um, since Jeremy was transparent enough, say he, he bailed out of Yale, I bailed out of Georgia Tech. I was quantitatively oriented. My parents said, go be an engineer. I'm like, all right, sure. I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Too much calc, emag, physics. Hated it. Came back home. My dad knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who worked at the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And I ended up working on the floor of the exchange. And like Jeremy, loved it. Loved being on the floor. Loved the language, the, you know, the, the terminology, the, the flow, the energy. It, it's, it was just great. Loved it. Was there for a few years, um, finished up at Drexel, ended up getting my degree in business. Uh, left uh, left the, the exchange after really rising pretty significantly there. Went to a trading firm, which were probably the eight best years of my life. Incredibly smart people, and you know, this industry has loads of smart people in it. You'll just, and that's a message to you. Soak it up. Talk to the smart people. Pick their brains, it's just a lot of fun. You're the smart people now, quite frankly. Um, I would spend a lot of time with you if I could, but take that opportunity to soak that up. Um, from there, and, and when I was in this trading firm, I did a lot of weird stuff, but new product development and focusing on indices, strangely enough, was a big part of my, my, my skill set. Uh, and that led me to, to Dow Jones. Dow Jones was bought, the Dow Jones Indices was bought two years ago by uh, McGraw-Hill, and now I'm part of the joint venture and on the executive team there. The, the thing that ties all that stuff together is I got all those gigs because I knew a person and I networked with a person. Um, my first entree on the floor of the exchange was opened by, by a relationship, but, that got, but I worked my tail off once I got there. Then I knew somebody at Susquehanna that got me in there. I sat next to a guy at a Brazilian steakhouse dinner many years ago. That led me to Dow Jones. The, John mentioned it, network. Network, network, network. And I don't mean I'm jumping down to the bottom. I don't mean just pinging somebody on LinkedIn. Ask people how you can help them. That's a big lesson I would give to you. Ask them how you can help them. Find a piece of research. Find an article that's germane to something you know they're interested in or working on. Send it to them. Not because it's going to help you necessarily, though it might. Send it because it's good and it's the right thing to do. I guarantee you, you'll see dividends to that. It's not just about trying to get LinkedIn contacts. Help the people you come in contact with. It's a huge component. I, uh, I, I just landed here this morning. Had a few meetings, came over here. Just walking the streets, going through some of the exchanges, I saw nine, 10 people that I used to work with. This is a big industry. It's a big industry, but it's very tight. 
It's very interconnected. It's very close. It's unbelievable how many people you come in contact with again that you once knew or you worked over there. Oh, you're over there now. I didn't know that. That's very cool. It's amazing how significant that works in our industry. You can leverage that, but it can also bite you in the rear end. Don't be a jerk. That's my other lesson. <laughs> be a good person. There's a management text on the shelves. You don't even need to buy it. You just need to see it. And forgive me my French. It's the no asshole rule. Don't be an asshole. You know? Be good to people. Just be the right person. Be, be helpful within your organization. Look for opportunities to advance, but advance while bringing other people along. Those would be my big messages. So I'll leave it at that. 